for a reason. God's economy took into account human mistakes. He took into account the fact that your mother and your father would get together out of wedlock. The fact that they were not married does not distract from your destiny and who God created you to be. Every single person, you are not here to take up space or to fill up landmass. Long before you were conceived by your parents, you were conceived in the mind of God. And I'm saying this because I hear young people come to my office all the time. They have no clue why they're here. And we're at a Christian college, that's where I work. They have no clue. I have no purpose. Long and they just think, okay, I'm here because my parents got together. Listen to me. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Long before you were conceived, long before your parents got together, you were conceived in the mind of God. He thought of you first. You're here, not by chance, not by faith, not because of what your mother or your father did, but because God wanted you here because he has a purpose for you to accomplish. Your people listen to me. You have gifts, you have abilities, you have talents that God wants for you to use in his house, in the workplace, at Walmart, wherever you are. I would like for one of you to read Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16. Could you please pull that up? Because sometimes they're, you know, they're not at all convinced. I want to see if I said it or if God said it. Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16. Jaden Brown. I'm going to call on you. I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of professor that you don't want to have. I ask for volunteers and then I call names. So Jaden Brown. Come on. Psalm 139. Can I get the NLT version? Because it kind of, it, it expresses it a little better. Jaden, I want for you to read 13. Debbie's daughter. What's your name again, honey? Sanik. I want for you to read 14. Um, Keon, you're going to read 15. Kiara 16, and I want for you to read it loudly. Psalm 139, verse 13. We're preaching together. Come, Jaden Brown. Verse 13. Loud. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Amen. 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 So, you knit me together in my mother's womb. God took the time out to make you the way you are, the way you look, your height, your skin color, your nails, your hair, everything about you. He designed that. Come on, Sunny. Verse 14. Thank you for making me so wonderful, complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well you how well I know it. Awesome. Thank you. Your workmanship. God made you wonderfully complex. Come on, Kian. Come on. You're going to read. I know you can do it. Come on. Set up yourself. Come on. 15. Verse 15. Wash me as I was being formed in the utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the so while you were being formed in your mother's womb, God was watching over you. Right there. Come on, Kiera. Verse 15. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day has had passed. Listen to me, people of God. Long before you saw me before I was born, I said you're not here by chance. You're not here to take up space in the church. Right. Every person has a purpose. Yes. Every moment was laid out before I was born, before a single day had passed. Absolutely. So God created you for a purpose. Absolutely. And if you don't believe me, if you want to go to the scientific data, you talk to any of them about DNA. No person is the same as any other, not even identical twins. They have a unique DNA. That means that God took the time to make every single person here special and different. You are unique. Nobody can take your place. You are unique. He custom made you. He determined the natural talents, the giftings, the abilities that you would have. Now, the enemy's plan is to tell you, you don't matter. Look at how you were born. 
Your parents didn't want you. You have no purpose. They didn't love you. You're useless. Look at what happened to you. God couldn't possibly use you. Look at your past. Look at your education. Look at what you don't have. Because he feeds us with lies. Because he knows the day we begin to walk in kingdom destiny. We are going to destroy his kingdom. And so from a very young age, he begins to tell you, you have no purpose in the church. The church is not for you. You have no talent. You have no gifts. So and so is better than you. They're a better speaker. They're a better singer. But every person has a place in the house of God. And I'm talking to both young and old. Old because, I mean, it's youth Sunday, but I'm not excluding anybody. Abraham was 75 years old when he started to walk with God. For 75 years, he walked with idols. And at 75, God called him and said, now I want for you to change course. It's never too late to change course. It's never too late to say, God, I have not been walking in my purpose, but now I'm ready. At any age, he was 75. And for the young, Jeremiah 1, verse 48, Jeremiah said, I knew you, this is God talking to him, before I formed you in your mother's womb. Could you pull that up, please? Jeremiah 1, we're reading from verses 4 to 8. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you are born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. Your people before you were born, Jaden before you were born, Kiera, Kion, all of you before you were born, God designed you with a purpose. He engineered you. He custom made you to fulfill a purpose here on this earth. Every single person here. And I'm telling you, he said, Lord, oh sovereign Lord, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. The Lord replied, don't say I'm too young. For you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of people. For I will be with you and will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. You are never too young. There are no excuses. Nicholas Vassal, never too young. I admire you playing here. I've seen your age playing elsewhere and in the clubhouse. You're never too young to serve the Lord. Jeremiah said, I'm too young. And God says, no, that's no excuse. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. Now Josiah had a terrible father who led away the people of God, who led away the people of God from serving God. But the Bible says in 2 Kings 22, he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed the example of David. He did not turn away from doing that what was right. So Josiah, at eight years old, proves that family history does not have to dictate your actions. You don't have to follow what your father did. You don't have to follow what your mother did, or what your cousin did, or what your brother did. Charge your own course. You are unique. Hallelujah. Josiah didn't do what his daddy did. No, he didn't. Daniel, in his teens, the Babylonians took him captive and placed him in three-year Babylonian education in their system because they wanted to wipe out any previous Israelite identity that he has. And I can see that taking place in our school system, oh, yeah. in the culture. Yeah. It's about wiping out everything that has to do with what is written in the book. Yeah. But Daniel was a teen and he did not cave in. He didn't say I have to be like the others. Daniel stood his ground. He refused to eat meat that was presented to him and God elevated him in this culture. It's not meat, but it's about following whatever else the world is doing because you don't want to stick out like a sore thumb. Let me tell you something. If you're going to walk in kingdom purpose, you're going to stick out like a sore thumb because we don't walk like them. We don't talk like them. We don't live like them. But living your kingdom purpose will be the best way for you to lead your life. So he was a teen and he changed the decree in a whole kingdom. Esther, for the ladies, she was a teen when she faced the king and changed the whole course that was going to wipe out her old race, all of the Jews. You are not too young. Joseph was sold into slavery at 17 and he had every right to be upset with God. But after he was sold into slavery, he worked to the best of his ability in Potiphar's house, even prison, and he resisted sexual sin. And let me tell you, because I'm coming to talk about that. 
Let me tell you the new age thing that they have telling young people that what the people of my age are saying that that is antiquated. That once two people agree and they're Christians, it's okay. It is not true. And though you are young, there are urges. God can keep you. He kept Joseph and he can keep you. If he couldn't, he wouldn't tell you to do it. And I'm here to tell you because they have all kinds of voices. You see it on the ad, you see it on media, you see it in the TV, everything they watch. They're pushing that, pushing that. It's okay. This casual encounter, I meet you, I like you, and I go on that scene. That's not how God designed you. You are not meant or designed to be every other person's partner because you're unique. You were custom made. You don't set yourself short or cheap. You walk away from those things. They mean you're no good. You're unique. You have a purpose. You are custom made. I want that to stick in your head. And you can do it. You can't do it in your strength. But God's spirit will. And so you enable you. And so we have Joseph and Timothy. Paul says to Timothy, don't let anybody think less of you because you're young. In the King James, it says, let no man despise your youth, but be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, in your faith, and in your purity. So that section one, number one, the first point, you were created for a purpose, and you are never too young, and you're never too old to walk in that purpose, and whatever God has called you to do, he has given you everything you need to do it, okay? Number two, and here's where we're gonna go to Kings to talk a little bit about Jehu. So could you please pull up back um, Kings, 2 Kings 9, and we're gonna talk about this man, Jehu and what, or Jehu, that's how they pronounce it, and then what he did when he found out what his purpose was. And finding out what your purpose is, that's a whole other thing. We could do a workshop on that. There are giftings and ability just for people to see where they would fit in the church. But for verses, um, we're just going to read from verse 1 to 12. Um, Sarah, I haven't seen you in a while. I'd like, would you please just read for me 2 Kings 9. And um, do I have the NLT? Yes, it's an easier version. Can you read about two verses? I'm coming down to you. Can you see it? Yes. Uh, read the first two verses, please. Meanwhile, Elisha the prophet had summoned a member of the group of prophets. Get ready to travel, he told him, and take this flask of olive oil with you. Go to Ramoth Gilead and find Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nim Nimshi. Mm -hmm. Call him into a private room away from his friends. Okay, Nicholas. And pour the olive oil over his head. Say to him, this is what the Lord says. I anoint you to be the king of, over Israel. Then open the door and run for your life. Okay, Abby. So the young prophet did as he was told and went to Mount Gilead. Raymond Gilead. Mm -hmm. One more verse, come on. Meanwhile, he arrived there. He found Jehu, 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 sitting around with the other army officers. I have, um, I have a message for you, Command. commander. He said, "For which one? One of us." Jehu asked for you, commander. He replied. So Jehu left the others and went into the house. Then the young prophet poured the oil over Jehu's head and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anoint you king over the Lord's people, Israel. You are to destroy your family of Ahab, your master. And this way I will avenge the murder of my prophets and the Lord's servants who were killed by Jezebel. The entire family of Ahab must be wiped out. I will destroy every one of his male descendants, slaves, and free alike anywhere in Israel. 
I will destroy the family of Ahab as I destroyed the families of Jeroboam, Jer Jeroboam son, son of Nabat, and Bathsheba, Basha, son of Aisha. Aisha. Good job. Come on, Ryan. Yeah, I know. Even one. <laughs> Dogs will eat Ahab, Ahab's wife, Jezebel, at the plot of land yeah, in Jezreel, and no one will bury her. Then the young prophet opened the door and ran. Okay. Awesome. Bless the Lord. They're supposed to be involved. Sometimes when you're reading, they're not paying attention. So I'm just making sure. Now there are a couple of things that I want to bring out. He comes and he says, I have a message for you. Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. That means there can be no mistake because there were different Jehus. I'm saying to you today, the message is for you, every person. God has properly identified you because you're young or you're old or you're middle aged. He says this message is for you. He was specific. And then there are two things or three things that he did that I want to point out. Number one, he says, when he comes with the message, he says, get him away from his companions. And I'm going to talk to us people of God, not only to young people. Sometimes to hear what God has to say to us. Sometimes we don't know our purpose because we are with companions that are not doing us any good. He says, get away, get him away from the companions. Some of you have toxic friends that you're going to need to let go of. It doesn't mean you stop talking to them, but your circle is too tight. It's too close and they're pulling you away from the things of God. And so he never delivered that message in the midst of the companion. He said, take him from his friends. No, it can be people. It can be things. It can be social media. It can be TV shows. It can be anything. Anything that prevents you from hearing God and knowing what your purpose is. That is your companion that you need to get away from. Then it also says he took him into an inner room, into a chamber. Come on, people of God, because we're not talking to the young people. I know I'm from the old school, but we're not telling them to seek the face of God. We come and they jump and they're okay, but they're going to need more than this to survive. You are going to need more than coming to church and singing and dancing to survive. You are going to have to learn and know how to seek the face of God for yourself, how to pray, how to fast. How to fight your own battles. Okay. The inn in the temple that was built by God for the Jewish people. There were three main parts to it. The outer court. The inner court. And the holy of holies. The manifest presence of God was only in the inner court. The holy of holies. Not in the outer court or the inner court. I'm sorry. It was not in the outer court or the inner court. But in the holy of holies. That's the innermost chambers. So we are not sometimes as effective as we need to be because we're not spending time in prayer locked away with God in the inner courts seeking his face and asking God what is my purpose what is my purpose in this life why was I created I'm not a vagabond I should not be wandering not knowing what my purpose is and as I said before, it's not contingent on your past, whether your parents wanted you or how you were born. That is totally different from your purpose and what God created you. And I, that's what I want to separate. Amen. So the, you need to go in the inner room. Separate yourself from anything that distracts you. And it says he poured oil over his head. That is a symbol of the anointing, of the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. Young people, you cannot function without the power of the Holy Amen. Ghost. You can, but it will not be effective. A lot of people preach in flesh. They walk in flesh, they say things that are motivational and they sound good, but it's not changing lives. For your ministry to be effective, for the worship team to be effective as you're leading Elijah, if I'm Nicholas as you're playing the instrument, whatever any one of you are doing, you need to ask God for the empowerment of yes, the Holy Spirit. Yes, yes, the anointing breaks yes, yoke. Yes, yes, Nicholas, you don't need to say a word. You sit there and you play those in that instrument, that keyboard, and yokes are broken because you're playing under the unction of the Holy Spirit. The anointing doesn't mean I have to talk. It doesn't mean I have to say anything. You're living under the anointing. You're walking your workplace and things not so right. You don't have to open your mouth. But when you step in, the presence of God, the
Israel and so she brought the heathen worship with her. She worshipped Baal and she never gave it up. Normally the wife would give in to the husband's religion but she kind of ruled over Ahab and so he, you know, he took on her idol worshipping and she was crafty, she was malicious, she was revengeful and she was the first instigator of persecution against the saints of God. And I'm going to tell you how she, two things Ahab one day, he was a king, and he saw this man with a vineyard. Yeah. And he says, I want your vineyard, and I'm going to give you a better one. So give me your little vineyard, and I'm going to give you a better one. The man says, no, I'm not going to despair. God gave this to me. This is my inheritance. And he goes home, and he cries. I want this. I want that. And Jezebel says, why are you crying? And he's like, well, I wanted that vineyard, and Naboth wouldn't give it to me. And she says, are you the king or not? I'm going to give that to you. You get up and eat. I'm going to take care of that for you. And listen, she got 
two men, two worthless men, and she says, I'm going to call a feast, and you're going to get two men and just tell them that neighbor, um, I just want to blasphemed. And then he said that the king, he said something bad about the king. Now, if you did that in those days, they'd stone you to death. Yeah, yeah. And so they did that, they stoned him to death. And then they told Jezebel, he's dead. And she goes and say, oh, honey, he's dead. You can have the vineyard now. Oh, got it, like that. Mm -hmm. Now, if that isn't sufficient, let's look at the example of Elijah. Because you could say, okay, that's out there. You all know of Elijah as a prophet of God, calling down fire from heaven and all of that. Now, I want for you to know, there's this specific day in which pastors talked about it. Elijah calls on fire from heaven, consumes the sacrifice. Baal couldn't answer. You all know about that story when there was a contest about the real God versus Baal and the real God won, right? But not, so it was a magnificent display of God's glory. And the prophets of Baal, those are the ones that worship because um, Jezebel had 850 of them worshiping Baal every day. They not only repented, but they turned and they helped Elijah to kill the false prophet. And then after that show, you know, Elijah goes on Mount Carmel and he kneels and he calls for rain to come back. And guess what? There was like seven, was it seven years of drought and the rain came back. That's the second thing. So not only did fire consume water and consume the sacrifice, he called on rain from heaven and it came and he ended the drought. But not only that, as if that wasn't enough, in that same day, they had to go to Jezreel from where they were, and it was 16 miles. And Elijah ran ahead of the chariots for 16 miles. So listen, there were horses riding, and the man, a man outran the horses. I can hardly keep up with my husband when he's up here dancing. Okay? I can tell you, because like he never gets tired. And for 16 miles, I'm telling you what the anointing can do. And this was a physical thing. It's not a, 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 um, a figurative thing. It happened for 16 miles. This man ran ahead of horses under the anointing of God. Because by the anointing, you can do exploits. In one day, I would be on a high. Now, when they told Jezebel, all they have done. You know what she said? May the gods kill me if I don't kill you by tomorrow. Okay, that's it. So let me tell you, when you begin to walk in kingdom purpose, when you start to help with the children's ministry, when you start to dance, when you start to help with cleaning the church, anything that God has called you to do, expect persecution. It will not be easy. Okay? And then you would think that Elijah would say, well, you know, after that day, you know, after all of that, I'm strong. You know what Elijah did? Elijah, he went, he runs for his life. Yeah. Because he knew of her and that she killed people without any remorse. Right. And she said, I'm going to kill you by tomorrow. And he runs and he says, God, just let me die because I'm the only one left. Right. So I'm going to tell you about the kind. Now, when I talk about the spirit of Jezebel, I'm not talking about a demon coming to possess you. I'm talking about the influence behind people who are like that. Now, what this spirit does, it distracts you from destiny, from your purpose. It instigates fear. So you become fearful. I can't do this. I don't have this talent. I can't lead children's ministry. I can't teach Sunday school. I can't do this and this because I'm to this, I'm to that. Or look at you. Who are you to think that you can do so and so? And so it instigates fear. It wants to control you, to tell you what to do. So after that mighty display of the power of God, she says, I'm going to kill you. No, the enemy is going to be after you in different ways. His purpose is to kill you, not only physically, but in different ways. If he can spoil you, if he can get you to go do drugs so that you die of overdose, that's what he wants. That's death for you, even if you don't die a physical death. Because it distracts you from your destiny. So it manifests itself in different ways, drugs, whatever, alcohol, anything that is going to destroy yeah. the gift that God has placed in you. Yeah. And so he's there. So Jehu comes there and verse 30, she heard of it. She painted her face. She um, tied her head, looked out the window, and she said, who are you, you Zimri? 
Now, Zimri was a man who had killed his master, and then they killed him back. So what Jezebel was saying, listen, I know what you just did, and I'm going to do the same thing that I did to Zimri. I'm going to kill you right now. Know that the enemy is going to be after you to kill your yes. purpose and yes. your passion. That's yes. what that means. Yes. So that's what she means when she said, you Zimri. She is saying, I know about Zimri and the same thing that happened to him, that's going to happen to you. Jehu did not respond to her. So the Bible says, stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. You don't need to respond to everything that people say or everything that the enemy throws your way. He does not respond to her because he wants to get you in this argument. He wants to get you to negotiate. And all he says, he looks up, she's looking through the window. He says, who is on my side? Now the Bible says, if God is for us, who can be against us? So who is on your side? God is on your side. So he looks up and he sees some men up there and instead of arguing with her, he says, who is on my side? And he says, throw her down. Throw her down. And they threw her down. And she died right there. The same thing threatening to kill him was killed right there. The same person, whatever is distracting you from your destiny, throw it down. Throw it through the window. Kill it. If it's fear, bring it to the feet of Christ and kill it and start doing what God tells you to do and stop telling yourself, I am to this, I am to that, I can't do that. Yes, if it's your past, bring it to Calvary and kill it. Yes. If it's what you did in your past, that has no bearing on your present and on the future that God has for you. If it's sickness that the enemy has used to assail your body and wants to keep you trapped in this mental thing, kill it. If it's bad experiences, throw it down the window and submit yourself to God. Because he will not fear. This woman was feared. Elijah ran from her because he was scared. But Jehu, he did not bother to argue with her. He says, who is on my side? God is on your side. He says, throw her down. And she was killed. So what I'm saying, whatever it is that's preventing you, throw it down the window fearlessly. Now he did it immediately. Didn't argue. He went straight away immediately. Relentlessly. He was like, I'm going to kill everyone in power who is doing, you know, leading the people astray. Just as God said, the whole house of Ahab. He did it relentlessly. He didn't stop. He didn't say, okay, I'm going to do this, but somebody said something, and so I'm going to stop like I did. And I can tell you, I'm preaching to me. Or somebody said something, I didn't like it, so I'm not going to do anything. Those nasty attitudes must be thrown out the window because we don't do God's purposes because we feel like we're entitled or God, you know, so, you know, he's using me like he's privileged to use me. I am privileged that he should look beyond my nasty thoughts and want to use a wretch like me. I don't know about you, but I know that I've been a wretch and only his grace has saved me. So I'm privileged. That he should want to use me. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. It's a privilege that God would want to use me. And so I'm saying to all of us today, as we're coming together as a church, we have to pull together. Pastor can't do it alone. He needs our help. You have a role. You have a part. Can you help in Sunday school? Can you help in youth ministry? Can you help with children's ministry? What can you do on your job? Can you change your life on the job? In Walmart when everybody gets in miserable, can you be a source of peace? Can you bring God's peace? Yes. What can you do? You, can, you don't have to be Okay? And so it's one o'clock. I'm coming down. Brian, use some of my time. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, three things and I'm done. You are created for a purpose. Yes, yes. Amen. You're not Amen. too old. Amen. You're not too young. Amen. So that means nobody's excluded. Amen. Separate yourself in order to walk in your destiny. Yes. Put away some of those things. Spend time with God in yes. prayer and the word. Seek the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You can't do it in yourself. It's going to be ineffective. Ignore the voice of the enemy. Ignore the people. Sometimes it's from the inside. The things telling you, you are not worth it. You have no value. You can't do X, Y, Z. Ignore that Jezebel spirit that seeks to kill, to destroy the dream that God has placed in you. By telling you you can't do it. 
the weapons of the warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination. Imagination is anything that tells you anything differently from what God says. You're beautifully and wonderfully made and you are designed by God. You have a purpose. Anything that says otherwise is an imagination that must be cast down, thrown out the window. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of Christ, I dare you walk in your anointing. Praise God. Praise God. You gotta, you gotta praise. 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 Your purpose. We're here for a reason. My God. 